uh, uh, karena sudah bersedia untuk mengisi mengisi kuliah 3 in one di Departemen Hukum Tata Negara. Terima kasih, Bu. Ya, sama-sama. <laughs> Baik, saya akhiri. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Ibu Indah, for opening the lecture today. For the next session, I will invite Ibu Prisha Ustiningrum SILLM as the moderator for today's lecture. To Ibu Prisha, Jamin's place is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Bu Auliana Bilah. So, uh, good afternoon, Professor Simon Bud. I think it's evening already in Australia, 2 p.m. in Indonesia and 6 p.m. in Australia. So, for all of the students, lecturers, uh, and participants that join these lectures, before uh, I give time to Professor Simon Bud to present the um, lectures, I would like to read uh, a short CV of him. Uh, Professor Simon Bud is a professor of Indonesian law. He is currently an associate director of the Center for Asian and Pacific Law at the University of Sydney Law School. Prior to joining Sydney Law School as senior lecturer, Simon also worked as a consultant for on the Indonesian legal system to the Australian government, private sectors, international organizations such as UNDP, ICJ, and etc. He also has taught uh, in over 70 law courses in Indonesia on a diverse range of topics, including intellectual property, Indonesian criminal law, including uh, constitutional law, human rights, Islamic law, and also adult law. So uh, before taking more time, uh, now, I would like to give chance to Professor Simon Bott to deliver the lectures. For everybody who are going to raise a question, you can just uh, write down your question on a chat because we only have a limited time. So in a, maybe um, out before we finish, then Professor Simon will answer some questions from the audience. So, Professor, would you sh uh, would you share your screen from your screen or from my screen, the PowerPoint? Okay. Perfect. Okay. Is, can everyone see that? Yes. Okay. Clearly. Nah, terima kasih banyak atas perkenalan yang akrab. Selamat malam dari Australia. Selamat siang di Indonesia. Uh, sayangnya kuliah ini akan saya sampaikan dalam bahasa Inggris karena memang itu merupakan salah satu syarat. Nanti sesi tanya jawab mungkin bisa di, dipakai bahasa Indonesia kalau mau. So, um, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, talk today. I am uh, very happy to be involved uh, with uh, Universitas Brawijaya. I've never been to Universitas Brawijaya, mungkin lewat, uh, but never, uh, I think, spent any time there, although I have spent uh, several trips in Malang, so beberapa kali, and maybe my favorite hotel in the whole world in Malang. Does everyone know, does everyone know which hotel? Is Tugu. it Tugu? Yeah, right. <laughs> Wah, luar biasa sebenarnya. Banyak antik-antik dan uh, uh, apa namanya, ciri yang lain yang bagus sekali. Okay, so um, I've been asked to talk a little bit today about constitutional review in uh, comparative perspective. And um, what I would like to do is begin a bit with a brief introduction about uh, constitutional uh, review in general, uh, and then focus on constitutional review in Australia, but hopefully to make it uh, uh, relevant, particularly to you, uh, I want to say a few things about how the system uh, compares with Indonesia's system as well. 
So just let me uh, work on this. This screen is not work, not sharing. Hold on. I think I'm in the wrong mode or something. Is that better? Oh yeah. Okay. Thank you. Why there is a little uh, choret di layar? Tadi mohon maaf karena memang tidak sengaja. Okay. So what is constitutional review? Well, um, it can mean uh, very different things in different countries. There are some uh, 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 universal features of constitutional review, I think, everywhere in the world, though. Um, there are two universal features. Um, the first is that constitutional review is the power to review something, some form of government uh, in, uh, instrument or action to make sure that it complies with the constitution. Uh, and really uh, that uh, the body that exercises that power of review is almost always a court, um, usually a very high court, uh, what we call an apex court in a particular legal system. Uh, and the second feature of constitutional review uh, is that that body, as I said, usually a court, will review whether the government has complied with the constitution. So I think these are the two main uh, universal features of constitutional review. You normally have a court and its main job is to work out whether the government has complied with the constitution. Um, but beyond those two quite universal features, uh, I think there are lots of variations in different systems across the world. Um, and we don't have time to discuss them all today. Um, it might um, be interesting though for me just to outline uh, two of the main models of constitutional review. Uh, the first is the US system. Um, and in that system, uh, any judge, even in the lower courts, can decide constitutional issues uh, and can apply constitutional law. Uh, the decisions of the lower courts can be appealed through the uh, appeal courts all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court gets the final say. And that is where uh, many of the main constitutional cases take place in the US Supreme Court. There are many famous um, judicial or constitutional review cases from the Supreme Court of America. Now, some people call the US system a decentralized model of constitutional review, because it's not focused in one particular court. All courts can exercise the power. Uh, and if we were to translate that into the Indonesian system, it would be a little bit like the Pangadilan Negri having power to uh, um, apply constitutional law and its decisions being appealed all the way up through the Pangadilan Tinggi to the Mahama Agung. Um, in the US system, there is no constitutional court. For constitutional courts, we need to look primarily to civil law countries, um, like in Europe and in many countries of Asia. Now, if the US system is decentralized, uh, many of the European countries have what we could call a centralized model where constitutional review and other constitutional functions uh, are decided by a specialized or special constitutional court. Now, as you will all know, Indonesia follows this model. Now, interestingly, I think Australia falls in between, somewhere in the middle of the US system and the European system. Um, like in the US, constitutional court cases are finally decided by our high court. 
which has jurisdiction over or can decide cases about a wide range of issues, not just constitutional issues. So constitutional law is only, only one of the areas of law uh, it covers. Um, but unlike the US system, um, the High Court is the only court that can decide constitutional cases. So it's a bit like the European model in that sense. Um, another point of variation uh, between systems uh, of constitutional review is precisely what the, um, the bodies exercising constitutional review can review. So what do they examine to make sure that, it's comply, that it complies with the constitution? Now, in Indonesia, you will all know that the constitutional court is limited to reviewing only legislation or statutes and laws enacted by the national parliament for compliance with the constitution. But in many other countries, perhaps most other countries, um, constitutional review is broader than this uh, and courts can review whether government regulations, and even government actions are in, in conformity or comply with the, the constitution. What particular variation a country has, what particular type model of constitutional review will often um, be influenced by the legal tradition followed in that particular country. So, for example, civil legal systems, civil law systems like Indonesia tend to have this centralized review via a constitutional court. But as I will try to explain today, history also explains some of the differences um, in constitutional review systems. Um, I think Australia's history uh, certainly says a lot about the type of constitutional review that Australia has. Now, as I'll explain today, constitutional review in Australia is quite different to constitutional review in Indonesia. In Australia, it really involves our High Court determining or deciding about the relative authority of levels of government. And I'll explain what that means in some detail. And it is almost never about human rights. In Indonesia, on the other hand, constitutional review is almost always about human rights and whether the government has uh, respected human rights in the legislation that it has enacted or the statutes that it has passed. So even though we both call this a system of constitutional review, the systems are very different and they serve um, quite different purposes, even though the main function is the same, that is to ensure that what the government does complies with the constitution. Now, just before I begin, um, I thought it might be useful for me to say a few words about terminology. Um, in particular, the difference between constitutional review and judicial review. Now, often the two words constitutional review and the two words judicial reviews are used interchangeably. They're considered to mean the same thing. Um, that makes sometimes uh, students a bit confused, I think. Judicial review really just means any kind of review by a court of government action. So reviewing government action by a court. Constitutional review is really uh, a subset of this. It is a part of this broader idea of judicial review. Um, sometimes when uh, uh, people use the word judicial review, particularly in common law countries. They can also be meaning what courts do in administrative law cases. So 
Um, government laws, government actions, do they comply with the law, not the constitution, but with other laws, um, undang undang? This is something that administrative courts uh, decide uh, cases about. And it is also called judicial review, particularly in, in, in common law countries. So just keep in mind that constitutional review and judicial review can mean different things, but sometimes mean the same thing. Um, it's a bit confusing, as I've said, but if you look into any of the um, materials uh, that are about constitutional review in Australia, um, any of the books that are available about constitutional law in Australia, you might see the use of this uh, term judicial review and I'm just trying to avoid you getting confused about it. Now, we're talking about the Australian legal system and I just wanted to start by mentioning how the Australian legal system arrived in Australia. This is critical um, to understand the Australian constitution, the federal constitution, because, and this may, this may surprise you, the Australian constitution is an act of parliament, is a law of the parliament of England. And it was enacted as a law in 1901 and uh, formed part of an English law. So the applicability of English law in Australia becomes very important as a result. Now, most of you will know that um, Australia uh, was a former colony of England. Here, yeah, there's a picture, a painting of Governor Philip, the uh, captain of the ship that brought um, the first boatload of people from England to Australia. He, as you can see in this picture, is raising the English flag in Australia. Uh, and he essentially declared that the law of England would apply in Australia. Now he uh, arrived in the state of New South Wales uh, in Sydney Cove. And I'll talk a little bit about Australian federalism um, in a minute. Now, of course, um, there were many Australian Aboriginals living in Australia at the time that Governor Philip arrived. And they had, as um, many Indonesian traditional communities have, they had developed a very rich uh, body of customary law, which they tended to apply in their own communities. So there were, if not a single body of law in Australia at the time the English arose or arrived, there were at least uh, bodies of traditional adat law already applicable in Australia. Now, when Governor Philip arrived in Australia, he decided, or he and his um, and the soldiers that were with him, decided to classify Australia as being uninhabited, or terra nullius, as you may have heard the term. Now, this is an important um, declaration or classification to make because um, it means that if a land is inhabited or uninhabited, I should say, if there's no one living there, then um, English law can simply be declared to exist. There's no legal system, so we can just impose the English legal system or apply the legal system of England um, in our new territory of Australia. Now, by contrast, under English law, if there was a pre-existing legal system in a particular place and England wanted to take over that territory, then England would have to work within the existing legal system and change it bit by bit with uh, English law. So really, even though there were people inhabiting Australia, the Aboriginal, Indigenous Aboriginal population, Governor Philip decided to declare that Australia was uninhabited. 
so that he could simply impose English law rather than having to follow Aboriginal customary law and then have that changed to introduce English law. Now, this all means that the Australian legal system is primarily based on a legal fiction because of course, there were many Aboriginals living in Australia. Uh, Australia was not terra nullius uninhabited when the English arose. And this legal fiction was finally recognized in the Mabo case, a very famous case in Australia, uh, where the High Court of Australia declared that in fact, Australia was not uninhabited when the English came. Uh, and one of the effects of this decision uh, is that a small number of Aboriginal communities have been able to uh, claim customary land rights, hakulayat, similar to hakulayat, uh, in some parts of Australia. Now, when Australia was colonised by the British, and this is important, I think, to understanding constitutional review in Australia, different settlements were established across Australia and they were really entirely separate countries for the purposes of the application of the law in Australia. We had the colony of, of New South Wales, which is where I am now, um, the colony of, of Victoria, which is south of New South Wales, um, and the other states and territories you can see here. Now, under um, colonial rule in Australia, each of these separate territories had their own parliaments and executives, um, including their own governors. And the systems of government that they employed largely followed English models. But by the 1900s, they decided or they began to see benefits in adding a level of central government purely to pursue their own mutual interests. So we have independent states and territories in Australia, um, but they realize that as the world is changing, um, there's a benefit, there would be a benefit to have a central system of government. Things like foreign affairs, dealing with foreign countries, um, interstate trade, um, how to govern or regulate trading goods and services between the various states and territories. Um, uh, national defence also is, a, is an issue that um, these states thought might be better um, managed from a central government perspective. They found it hard to, to do these things themselves and decided to form a federation a, the, an establish a layer of government that went over all of these states and territories. And this was established with the enactment of Australia's constitution. As I said, a law of the British Parliament. Um, you may be interested to know that um, the Federation of Australia was largely mutual and quite smooth. Um, the main problems were choosing a capital, um, Sydney in New South Wales and Melbourne in Victoria, both thought that they should become the capital and refused to acknowledge that the other one could possibly be the capital. And the solution was creating a new city in Canberra. Uh, so that the, a capital was created simply because Sydney and Melbourne couldn't decide uh, which of them should be the capital of Australia. Another issue was convincing Western Australia to join the Federation. Western Australia is a very large state and commonly thinks that it should not form part of Australia. It's um, you know, very rich in natural resources and, and thinks it deserves to keep uh, most of the, the, the money that or the, the income that's generated from them. There was a lot of time and effort going into deciding whether New Zealand should join the Federation of Australia, eventually it did not. Um, and funnily enough, fixing the railways was a, uh, the train system was a, a major issue because 
And this quite symbolises the, the way that um, the system of government in Australia worked so separately. Because the governments were separate, um, the, uh, the governments had established different size railway tracks. So in order to travel, for example, between New South Wales and Queensland, um, travellers would have to stop at the border and get on a new train with different size tracks in order to, to continue on. So um, some of the states had to change their uh, railway tracks in order for trains to be able to operate around the whole of Australia. Interesting, I think, little uh, fact. So in summary then, Australia is a federation. Now central government is often called different things. It's sometimes called the federal government, sometimes called the central government, sometimes called the national government, the Australian government, or even the Commonwealth government, but it means the same thing. It is the central government that covers the whole of Australia. There are six state and two territory governments. Um, and uh, there are also quite a lot of local councils. So they're local um, grassroots governments that um, uh, regulate things like garbage collection and fixing roads and things like that, that are quite localised uh, in, uh, in scale. Now I've mentioned um, some of these points already. Um, the National Constitution uh, of 1901, sorry, not 1900, um, contained in, uh, in a British uh, Act of Parliament. Um, so if you, if you read it, it's just like a normal undang undang. Uh, it has section one, section two, section three, section four, section five, section six, section seven, section eight, and section nine is the entirety of the Australian Constitution. It's been amended a few times. Uh, in order to amend the Australian Constitution, the National Constitution, it needs to be by, um, by referendum. Um, now, it bears noting as well that all of the states also have their own constitutions. So it would be like a provincial government in Indonesia having a, a constitution of its own. In a, in a, in a, I mean, a roughly similar, not, not the same, obviously. Uh, but uh, there are in any place in Australia at least two constitutions operating, the state constitution where you are, but also the national constitution kind of over the top. Now, as I've said, um, the Australian Constitution is, um, well, well, sorry, constitutional review in Australia is not really about human rights. And one of the reasons why that is the case is that there are almost no human rights in the Australian Constitution. I love telling um, my students of Indonesian law that in Indonesia, there are far more human rights in the constitution. Uh, there are far more constitutionally protected human rights than in Australia. Uh, we only have a few, um, and here are some examples. We have freedom of religion, although that essentially is taken to mean that the government can play no part in religion, in regulating religion in Australia. Um, there's a, a right to a trial by jury, Interestingly, many people decide, many criminal people, uh, defendants, criminal defendants decide not to exercise that right. They decide to have their trials um, just by a judge, not with a jury. Um, there's also section 51, um, uh, acquisition of property on just terms. So if the government wants to take your property for say a highway or a development, it must pay you adequate compensation. That's also considered to be one of the very few constitutional rights. Um, despite Australia being a, a democracy, there's no express right to freedom of speech. And there's not even an express right to vote, but both of those things are in practice, most of the time at least, respected and held dear by Australians. 
I just want to mention one thing um, here. You see at the bottom of the slide, implied rights. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, it's a, a implied right is, an, is a term that's used by constitutional judges and, um, and lawyers and, and academics. And what it means is a right that exists in the constitution, even though it's not written in the constitution. So, um, uh, for example, uh, because we have a system of democracy established in the constitution, we have parliaments that are elected, um, for example, and we have, uh, as I say, we have elections. Um, the, the, the High Court of Australia has decided that we need to be able to talk freely about political matters. So there's nothing that the government can do by legislation to prevent us from talking about politics. Um, even though there is no specific um, uh, right in the constitution that grants, um, uh, uh, that, that exists to um, grant that right to citizens. It's quite complicated and com complex. Now, you have to let me know how we're, go how we're going for time. We finish at about 7.15, right? Yes, I think. Excellent, good, we have plenty, I think. Now, uh, back at the time of federation in Australia, you'll remember that the states were um, independent. They had a lot of power. They could do whatever they wanted. Um, they could pass laws on whatever they wanted. They thought it would be a good idea to have a central government to help them do things that they found difficult to do themselves, things that required them to collaborate. They, in establishing this federation, they agreed to this federation. Um, they didn't want to lose too much power. All they wanted to do was to give enough power to a central government to exercise the functions that they wanted the central government to exercise. So this is reflected in section 51 of the constitution and section 52. Section 51 includes or says, sets out, I should say, um, what we call the heads of power of the Commonwealth. These are the things about which the Commonwealth can pass laws. And I'll have a look, I'll, sorry, I'll, I'll put up a slide of the entire list of things the Commonwealth government can pass laws about. Now, section 52, sorry, I should just go back. So critically, section 51, the things that are mentioned in section 51, things like um, trade between states and external affairs are, um, reg can be regulated by the central government, but um, the states also have power to pass laws about those matters too. So we call section 51 concurrent legislative powers, which means that legislative powers that are held by both the central and the state governments. Section 52, we're not gonna talk about today, um, but it sets out things that only the Commonwealth government can pass laws about. The states have no power to pass laws about the things mentioned in 52, section 52. Things like defense forces and the currency coining of money are things that only the Commonwealth government can deal with. The real um, contest, the real uh, area of con constitutional review in Australia um, revolves around um, section 51, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit more detail. But essentially what we get in, um, in Australia are contests, or I like to say fights, but they're not really fights, uh, between the states and the Commonwealth government about which government has jurisdiction over a particular thing or matter, subject matter. So 
let me give you from a very general um, perspective an example. Uh, a state government might pass a law that the Commonwealth government doesn't like. The Commonwealth might then take that state to the High Court and argue that the Commonwealth and not the state has jurisdiction to pass that law. And if the court agrees, then it will usually invalidate that law. So it will invalidate the state law. Um, as we'll see, um, if there are two laws that um, contradict each other, one being a Commonwealth, one being a state law, the Commonwealth law will, will, will prevail. By that I mean the Commonwealth law will invalidate or will, will, um, uh, uh, will override the state law. So alternatively, a state government might pass a law, uh, sorry, might not like a law that the Commonwealth um, has passed. And so it might bring a case to the High Court arguing that the Commonwealth doesn't have power under Section 51 to pass the law that it has. Uh, and as I said, these types of jurisdictional disputes are really the essence of constitutional review in Australia. So just to summarise, Section 51 mentions a whole lot of things that the Commonwealth Government can pass laws about. The state governments have power to pass laws on those things and everything else um, that, it, that they want to pass laws about um, under their own constitutions. The Commonwealth law will always um, override the state law if there's an inconsistency between the two. So we have really, I suppose, two types of disputes that um, come before that are decided by uh, our High Court about Section 51. The first is um, if the Commonwealth passes a law, a state government might say, well, you don't have power to pass that law because it's a law about something that's not mentioned in Article 51. That's the first type. Um, and the second type is where the Commonwealth passes a law uh, and basically asks the High Court to invalidate a state law that contravenes or is inconsistent with that um, Commonwealth law. And this is a picture of our, uh, our High Court of Australia um, in Canberra, although it sits in many of the capital cities of Australia. Um, and I've kind of covered the, the uh, the points I make here on this slide. What I'm going to do on Wednesdays or in Wednesday's lecture is talk a bit more about section 109 because I think it's quite interesting to compare Australia and Indonesia um, in this sense. We have uh, uh, this system where the Commonwealth law will always prevail in the sense or will always override a state law if they're inconsistent. But how do you work out whether two laws are inconsistent? Um, now, in Indonesia, I'm not sure the courts really um, spend much time thinking about um, what makes two laws consistent or not. Sometimes when I read Indonesian cases, if one law is about a particular topic and another law is about the same topic, the court will think that they're inconsistent because they both regulate the same the same topic, and so the higher law will usually um, uh, will usually um, override the lower law. Um, there's actually quite a nuanced or quite a um, detailed um, jurisprudence from the High Court of Australia about when we can say that two laws do or do not conflict, and so I want to focus a little bit on that, maybe to um, uh, to be used as a comparison to talk about um, the situation in, in Indonesia. 
Now, this is section 51, and we generally say uses S for section. Um, uh, and it basically says the Parliament shall, subject to this constitution, have power to make laws for the peace, order, and good government of the Commonwealth with respect to. And this is where we, um, we get the, the various things that the Commonwealth government can pass laws about. Trade and commerce with other countries and between states. So this is, what I'm gonna do is just focus on some of the important provisions here. You can see um, the first head of power there, trade and commerce. Also taxation. Um, the, the central government will often collect the tax and then distribute it to the, to the states as it sees fit. And this is very controversial in Australia. Um, we have defence at number six there. I'm just gonna move on to the next slide. Um, one of the, the really important heads of power has been uh, 10, uh, sorry, 20 um, foreign corporations and trading or for financial corporations. So the, the national government has power to regulate corporations. And of course, because a lot of business these days is, um, is done through corporate entities, this gives the Commonwealth quite a lot of power to regulate um, business activities in Australia. We also have um, family law, marriage, divorce, these types of things. Um, we have the race power. The Commonwealth can pass laws about, um, about uh, or for people uh, of a particular race. And really important is the last one here, the external affairs power. Um, the um, the, the national government has power to um, enter into or to, to pass laws about um, relations with other countries and you know, giving effect, uh, transforming international law into the Australian legal systems. So in our constitutional law cases, our constitutional review cases, the main task of the High Court is often to consider whether these heads of power have enough scope um, to, to cover the law that the Commonwealth wants to pass. And if it doesn't have a power to pass a law that can be linked to one of these heads of power, then the Commonwealth law will um, have no legal basis and can be invalidated by the court. Now, one of the great themes of Australian constitutional law um, is that ever since Federation, the Commonwealth has been pushing at the boundaries of its lawmaking powers. In other words, it has tried to be, become more powerful uh, and to pass laws on a wide variety of matters, a wider variety of matters. Some would argue that it's expanding its powers. Of course, the state governments, remembering what the bargain was or that the deal was back at Federation, um, just giving a limited part of its powers to the central government, um, don't really like this move towards greater Commonwealth power. Um, one of the more controversial heads of power, um, as I've mentioned, is external affairs. It gives the Commonwealth a lot of power to pass a law about um, anything that relates to an international treaty Australia has signed, from the environment to trade to human rights and the like. And it is um, that forms the basis of many laws that the national government has, has passed and has kind of marginalised the states to some degree. Now, what I want to do uh, in the final slide here is to give you a example of how this, I mean, it must feel quite uh, foreign to you, um, how this uh, system of Australian constitutional review works. Now, I mentioned the Mabo case earlier on, that's probably um, the most famous constitutional law decision in Australian history. Um, but this Tasmanian Dams case, it's Tasmania versus the Commonwealth 
um, is also quite famous. And because these types of cases involve disputes between the state, the state government and the Commonwealth government, that's what the name of the case is. So we have of Tasmania v Commonwealth, or New South Wales v Commonwealth, um, uh, as the title for most of these types of cases. Now, this is a case that the um, Australian High Court uh, heard and decided in 1983. And it's quite an interesting case, I think. The picture here I have uh, on the slide is of the Franklin Dam, or the, sorry, the Franklin River in Tasmania. Um, one of the beautiful parts of the world, very rich biodiversity, hasn't really been touched by human development. Uh, very uh, beautiful area of, of the world. Now, in Tasmania in the 1970s and 1980s, there was a preference for hydroelectricity. So electricity uh, created by the movement of, of, of water. And the Hydroelectric Commission of Tasmania had written, which was a, um, uh, a, a Tasmanian um, com company, had made many dams and produced um, much electricity for dis distribution and use in Tasmania. Uh, and it wanted to, um, to build a dam on this beautiful river for hydroelectric power. Now, the problem with building this dam was that it would have flooded very large sections of the river, which would have um, decimated the um, landscape. Um, there were also significant Aboriginal indigenous sites that um, tended to indicate that um, Humans had been living there for 20,000 years. Uh, these sites would also have been at risk of destruction um, if this dam was to be built. So we have on the one hand, the need to create electricity, but on the other hand, the dire or very bad environmental impact of um, building this dam. Now, um, the area was an area listed under the World Heritage Convention, so under an international treaty. The area, this area of Tasmania was to be protected under international law. Uh, and when the proposal to um, build the dam was being discussed and debated, there were lots of environmental protests. Um, 6,000 people were arrested after some, you know, due to the demonstrations. Um, people involved in the decision-making received death threats. Um, and politics played a very significant role. So the, we have two main parties, political parties in Australia, the Liberal Party and the Labor Party. The Liberal Party was the government uh, in the state of Tasmania. And it supported the, um, the dam and, and the hydroelectric commission. Um, it was a very large, the, the HEC was a very large employer. I think it was the state's largest employer uh, at the time. And it provided some of the more um, financially uh, cheap electricity uh, in Australia supporting local businesses. Um, uh, there was also uh, an anticipated electricity shortage that would, was, was, was kind of um, predicted to occur soon. So the Liberal Party in Tasmania really wanted this dam to be made. Um, now, the central government, the Commonwealth government at the time, was a Labor government. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, one of one of our more famous politicians, Bob Hawke, you may have heard of him, um, promised just before an election that he would stop the building of the dam if he was elected. And of course, he was elected. 
So he had made this election promise to stop the dam. So we have the Tasmanian state government wanting the dam a lot and the Commonwealth government saying, well, no, we don't want the dam to go ahead. And so what the, the state, sorry, the central government, the Commonwealth government did was to pass the World Heritage Properties Conservation Act of 1983. And what it did was to give effect in Australia to the World Heritage Convention, which listed the Franklin Dam as a, uh, as a heritage listed site. It banned under international, under this international treaty, the clearing, excavation, or other commercial activities within this broader um, wilderness heritage area into which the Franklin River fell. The Tasmanian government had passed legislation, passed laws that allowed for the dam to be built. So what do we have here? Oh, sorry, my lamp just, my light, my light just went out, hold on. Uh, sorry, Professor Simon. Uh, there are three questions from the participants on chat. Will okay. we, yeah. Um, Can I just finish? I'll just finish this yeah, yeah, case yeah, because yeah, I hope yeah. I hope this will make make it clear what judicial okay. what constitutional review is about in Australia. Um, so we have a Tasmanian law which says the dam can take place. We have a Commonwealth law which says um, the dam cannot take place because of the international convention that requires the conservation of the Franklin River. Now, one question I wanted to ask was, if you were, if this case was happening in Indonesia, how would it be decided? What basis would the Constitutional Court of Indonesia look at? Maybe it would look to the right to a healthy environment in the constitution? I think it depends on the local government's law. There are some uh, requirements uh, that it is the authority of the central governments and there are some that is the authorities of the local government. And because we are um, uh, you know, unitary state, so the power of central government will be so um, big compared to the federalism, yeah, I think. Mm. Well, it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because in which court would you take that to in Indonesia? It's the Supreme um, Court. You take the Supreme Court. To, if if we if we say that the state government um, law in Australia is like a provincial perda, uh, and the yeah. uh, and the and the Commonwealth government provision is the government Commonwealth law is like a undang undang then would it go to the Supreme Court or the Constitutional Court? Yes, if it is as a perda, so it is to the Supreme Court. But okay. if it is um, uh, it is not perda, but uh, other regulations uh, oh. lower than perda, it is go to the Administrative Court. Okay, okay. So there'd be quite a bit of difficulty, wouldn't there? I mean, would it be possible for a... Uh, an environment, sorry, for um, someone who supported the dam in Indonesia to go to the Constitutional Court to have the, um, the Parda invalidated? No, because the Constitutional Court doesn't have power over Parda. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It is to the now, Supreme Court, I think, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It's interesting because, um, you know, if, if, if the Commonwealth government had been trying to create the dam here, uh, and then we tried to transplant the case to Indonesia. This might be about human rights. This might be about whether the law um, uh, uh, violated the right to a good and healthy environment in the Indonesian constitution. In Australia though, it's about the relative authorities of the state versus the national 
government. And um, essentially what the court decided was that the national government, the Commonwealth government, um, had power to pass a law uh, giving effect to the World Heritage Convention. Um, and because that law, which was the World Heritage Properties Con Conservation Act, conflicted with the Hydro uh, Electric Commission Act that the Tasmanian government had passed, then the Tasmanian law was invalidated. So it's quite interesting, really, isn't it? Because this is a case where the main issue is should the dam go ahead or not, but it's decided on the basis of whether the Commonwealth government has power to pass a law giving effect to an international convention. So it's quite a technical legal case. Um, and it's <clears throat> formed the basis for, as I mentioned before, you know, this quite significant um, um, expansion of Commonwealth government power uh, under this external affairs power because it now, under this case, can enact legislation to give effect to any international treaty. And that's quite a broad power, isn't it? Um, there's also an argument that um, the Hydroelectric Commission of Tasmania, because it was a corporation, was something that the, um, the Commonwealth government could uh, pass a law about and ban from, um, from engaging in um, kind of these dam activities. Uh, but that was less of, of, an, of, a, of an important part of, of the decision than the external affairs power. All right, so that's what I wanted to say today, particularly as an introduction to the um, to the uh, system of constitutional review in Australia. Um, <clears throat> I hope it's made it a bit uh, clearer. I hope you can uh, kind of see how our system is different to Indonesia's, primarily because of our history. Um, and the fact that we don't have a Bill of Rights, we don't have a, a, <clears throat> a large list of rights in our constitution like you do in Indonesia, which means that most of the constitutional law cases that we have are not about human rights like they are in Indonesia. Um, this case is, the Tasmanian Dam's case, I think is really about environmental rights and protecting the environment, but it's been decided on this kind of quite technical ground of whether the state and the Commonwealth government have passed laws on the same topic, who has power to pass the laws on what. Uh, in Indonesia, it might be a very different um, uh, decision. It might be based on, on one of those rights rather than, rather than the relative authority of the state and the central government. Okay, have we got any questions? Yeah, we have seven questions, but I okay. don't think there is time to answer this all. Should we choose uh, the most uh, uh, the questions that is uh, that is likely connected to the topic, or we just sure. answer from the first? Uh -huh. Okay, let me have a look. Oh, at the young controversial banget. So yeah. we have the one is about omnibus law. Oh no, don't ask. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the second is about from Pak Dahlan. Does the Australian justice system recognize formal and material reviews? Yep. Yes. Yes, it does. Um, but it's very rare that uh, a law is passed in a way that violates the, the, the material reviews. Um, of course, proper lawmaking processes need to be followed, but they usually are in Australia. Um, and... If they're not, I mean, yeah, it, I think there's a level of transparency in the process that guarantees that there is um, there is a proper consultation with the uh, masyarakat. Um, I know in Indonesia recently there's been a tendency for the national parliament to pass laws 
very quickly and very secretively, um, uh, which has led to some controversial legislation, uh, including the omnibus law uh, from Antari. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think we've got time to go into the omnibus law. It's a very complicated and con uh, complex uh, problem. But I just think it's, it's a very confusing way to engage in law reform. Um, quite apart from the substance of the amendments, which are very problematic, the way that a, a law that can um, change, what is it, 70 something pieces of legislation just with one, one law, uh, very confusing. It's already confusing enough in Indonesia. When you look for uh, laws that have been amended, if you want to find the provisions of the, 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 the current law, you have to look through all of the amendments because there's not a consolidated version. So I think that um, one way to avoid um, that problem in Indonesia would be to re-distribute, um, reproduce all of the laws that the omnibus law changes and um, make them readily available to the public so there's no confusion about whether various provisions have been um, invalidated or, or not. Um, emergency laws like a parapu, uh, I think in Australia it's a bit different. We would have, uh, we would have to have a, a state of emergency that would give the, um, uh, the Prime Minister extraordinary powers. Um, but I must admit, it's something that we very rarely have uh, happen in Australia, unlike in Indonesia, where you have the purple. Um, so it's not something that um, has really uh, been reported much in the Australian media like it is in Indonesia. Uh, it, 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 it is correlated with the parliamentary and presidential system, why it yes. is rare in Australia, yeah. Yes, that's right. So in Australia, our prime minister is not directly elected like uh, the president in, of Indonesia. The prime minister is the leader of the party that has a majority in, in parliament, that has more seats than any other party in, in parliament. Um, are you who gives final assent on the approved law? I think we have a similar um, system to you uh, in the sense that it's supposed to be signed off by the, the, by the well, in Australia, it's by the, the English uh, representative. But um, in uh, in practice, that person will sign the let sign the um, the, the law uh, automatically. So there's never been a case, as far as I know, of a of an English representative, say the Governor General um, for uh, for Commonwealth laws or the governors of the states. There's never been a a case where those laws haven't been signed off by by the relevant. Um, executive authority. Oh, the Veronica Common case, I, um, I don't know anything about that case in terms of what's happened recently. I read in the Indonesian news that uh, people had put together some money to pay the fees that um, were owed, uh, um, but I don't, I don't know if there's been any developments on, on that case. Thank you, Laras. Um, how important is the existence of religion in a constitution? You guys are asking all the controversial questions, right? Um, there, it's quite quite interesting in uh, in Australia. I mean, we don't have, uh, in terms of constitutional rights, um, much in the way of of freedom of of religion. There is a mention of that in the constitution but the way the um the supreme court of, of the high court i should say of australia has interpreted um that right is to give it make it very narrow so all it does is requires that the government doesn't interfere doesn't regulate doesn't give preference to particular religions over others uh, it doesn't require religion religious adherence it's not like Panchasila with Ketuanan Yang Maha Esa. Yeah. No such thing like that in, in Australia. Um, I, uh, so I'm not an expert in kind of um, uh, kind of the right to a religion in, in Australia. Um, I've done some work on it in the Indonesian context, but 
I've never really thought about how important the existence of religion is as a constitutional right. I mean, it is in Indonesia. And so um, there are various implications that flow from that. Uh, I, do I think human rights uh, in the constitution is important? Well, I do. Um, in a country like Indonesia, um, where it's basically what the constitutional court does, that is, it determines whether laws meet human rights standards contained in the constitution. Um, so I think it's critical. There have been some cases where the constitutional court has really upheld human rights very well in Indonesia. Now, in Australia, on the other hand, there are uh, two states that have um, made laws about human rights that provide human rights guarantees, a bit like what's in your constitution. But other than that, the main thinking in Australian political uh, science or political thought, legal thought too, is that if Australia is, a, is an effective democracy, then that is the best guarantee of, of human rights. So people aren't going to vote for a government that violates human rights. And so you have, a, and this is the thinking behind the, 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 there not being a Bill of Rights or a catalogue of rights in the Australian Constitution. Um, many people now argue that this isn't enough anymore, that the, um, uh, the, the, um, that it isn't enough anymore that we need we need a Bill of Rights in Australia to protect, you know, refugees, protect freedom of speech, protect all sorts of other things, um, citizenship, uh, these types of, of issues. Um, but I don't think there's much of a movement to change that at the moment. So I think it's critical in a country like Indonesia, particularly where you have a constitutional court that's quite active. Um, in a country like Australia, maybe it's a bit less necessary, but um, but some people say that if we should still have human rights in our constitution anyway. Uh, from Michelle Mitchell Rose, uh, I want to ask you how Australia prevents religious cases if there's no law that sets about religious about religion. Um, that's a very good question. And I don't really know how to answer that. I mean, I think it's got something to do with the different way that religion. Um, plays a role in society in Australia. Everyone is free to um, engage in their own religious practice to the extent that it doesn't harm anyone else. Um, there's no expectation that people um, have a religion in Australia. There's no um, uh, barrier on uh, entry into the public service. Uh, we have same-sex marriage now in Australia, which a lot of people reject, um, but it has been it has been um, enacted into law. Um, I, I, I mean, and, and there are problems with religion in in Australia. Um, there's, I mean, we have to look at what happened in um, in uh, in New Zealand uh, a few years ago. There's a whole lot of, of issues that, um, that that religion has has raised and that, that, that um, you know, causes conflict in, in the community. But in Australia, it's still not really seen as, a, as anything that the state should be involved in. And so there's no real support given by the state to any religion or religions. It's considered to be primarily a private matter. Uh, so from Muranto, in my opinion, there are only beneficial and unbeneficial ones. So the perfect human rights are in God's hands. What do you think about my statement, sir? Um, I don't quite understand the question, but I guess the 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 issue is what is the what does the constitution say, and what is the function of constitutional review in a particular country? So. In Indonesia, the main function of the constitutional court is to um, is to apply the constitution. Now, sure, there are religious rights in the constitution, and the constitutional court gives effect to them. We have blasphemy law case, we have the KTP case in Indonesia, these types of, of things. But really, what we're doing is looking at what the constitution says and how the court applies the constitution. 
Um, so have we, I, I sent around the, the uh, PowerPoint presentation to everyone. Has everyone been able to receive that through the chat? Yeah, yeah, I think okay. he just need to scroll up. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, think... maybe that's, that's all for the questions today. So uh, we are fortunate to have you in this lecture today, Professor Simon, and we will meet again on Wednesday. Yep. Um, on the same uh, hour, on the same time. Yep. Um, so for everybody who are keen to listen to the next sessions uh, to explore more about the um, differences between Indonesia and Australia, uh, particularly uh, in constitutional review, you could join us in the next meeting. Okay, so do you do you want to have uh, concluding remarks, Prof. Simon? Uh, well, yes. Um, thanks very much for for inviting me to chat. If the group is going to be the same, it might be nice to start the next lecture with a. Uh, with question and answers, because if there are people who want to who go away and think about it and come back, maybe look through the slides and 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 have some some more thoughts or ideas, I'd be very happy to start with maybe fifteen minutes of question and answers. I'll give a lecture about conflicts, and then we we can have another brief question and answer session. Um, because I mean, a lot of the material that I've used, um, students can find. Um, themselves uh, as well. So it'd be good to be able to answer answer questions that students have. All right. So the next session, we will, uh, you still can raise a question to Professor Simon Bhatt. So kind of you, Professor. Thank you oh, very much. Kasih. We are happy to have you today. Uh, terima kasih semua mahasiswa yang sudah join uh, di pertemuan mendatang. Uh, jika masih ada pertanyaan di benak Anda, silahkan disampaikan ke Profesor Simon di hari Rabu. Uh, karena kelas akan kita mulai, mungkin jika ada pertanyaan kita akan mulai dengan tanya jawab. Ya. Uh, hmm. Terima kasih. Uh, have a good day. Uh, stay safe in this pandemic situations. And see you on the next session. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Good afternoon. Thank you.